have the kids still in here, and so uh, we love having them worship with us, but we're getting ready to send them out off to their classes. So uh, let's say this a blessing over them as they go. Children, Jesus knows what it's like to be sick and to hurt. May you know that he's with you, even in the hard times. All right, kids, you can go off to your classes and uh, find your way there. I love that about this church, having the kids uh, in with us uh, for worship and stuff like that. All right. Well, I'm excited to be with you again this morning. Um, it's been really fun for me these last few weeks, trying to get my arms around all that this church is doing and um, just really getting to know who this church is. And one of the fun things has been uh, each of the last three weeks, as I've been sitting in worship, especially during that greeting time, I've met somebody here who's here for the very first time each week, which I love. I love that this is an inviting place, that this is an inclusive place, that, that, that you all feel very comfortable uh, saying to your friends, your neighbors, hey, this is a place where I go and connect with God, you should come too. And, and the new people are coming uh, in the doors, which is really fun. And I've really appreciated, especially this week, I was able to get with a number of different people um, and I appreciate the hunger that there is for God among you. Uh, even yesterday, an example, I went, uh, went to the breakfast where a bunch of men were eating a lot of bacon. Keith was not wrong about the bacon. <laughs> Four different kinds. And, um, you know, so there was like 15 or 17 of us sitting around a table, and we were having a conversation that very easily could have stayed on sort of the surface level. But the guys didn't keep it there. The conversation went very real and very deep and connected our faith with real life. And I just left thinking, man, these, that's a group of hungry men who want to know God more. It was really encouraging. And, um, and then there's new exciting things happening. Uh, met with some guys who are going to start a men's community group. Um, you heard about the elective class that's going to start next week. This is a great place to be. God has pursued us, and this is a group of people who are responding to God's pursuit. So it's a great place to be. Uh, we're studying the book of Jonah. And if you haven't been with us, the main idea of Jonah is that God is in pursuit of us. God is in pursuit of everyone in the book of Jonah. He's going after the Ninevites. He's going after Jonah. We found last week he's going after this group of sailors. So God is going after us, but the way that God pursues us is always through other people. And so as a church, we've sort of taken on the challenge for the, uh, this six weeks while we're studying this book to be praying this kind of prayer. Um, and not necessarily these words, but to pray a prayer like this every day. Gracious God, who's always at work around me. Actually, why don't we read this together just to sort of refresh us, okay? Gracious God, who's always at work around me, give me eyes of compassion, ears of understanding, and a mouth of courage to share your love with the people I encounter today. Thank you that the results are in your hands. So we've been praying this every day. And I, I was talking with a guy earlier this week. He said the day after he started praying this, God gave him an opportunity. Uh, one of the people who works for him came into his office. And, and he had been struggling with some sickness and uh, found out that, that he has a pretty rare and aggressive form of cancer. And the guy from Trinity here just said he knew in that instant God was giving him a sort of divine opportunity to, to care for this guy and to say, you know, I'm going to be praying for you in this. Another, another lady told me a story this week how there was a very specific friend she was praying for. Uh, praying that God would give her an opportunity to connect and share some of her story because this other gal has a very similar background. And so she'd been praying for an opportunity. Well, it finally came this week. And she was able to open up and share her whole story of how Christ has pursued her and drawn her into a relationship with him. God's answering this prayer as, as we pray as a church. So if you have opportunities when, when God answers this in your life, uh, share it with somebody. Share it with somebody next to you or uh, email us. We'd love to hear those stories just to be able to encourage the body. So let's continue on with the story in Jonah. Last week we left Jonah. He was in a very bad place. He, uh, he's been disobedient. God said, hey, Jonah, I want you to go this way. And Jonah said, no, I'm going that way. Uh, he's disinterested. God keeps trying to get Jonah's attention. And Jonah's heart is hard. He's not hearing it. So that's sort of where we've picked up. Uh, Jonah's in this hard place, but all of that's going to change at this point in the story. 
Uh, one time, a little girl was uh, sitting on a park bench, and, and she had her Bible, and she was reading the story of Jonah. And an old man came and sat down on the other edge of the, the bench, and he leaned over, and he saw that she was reading the book of Jonah, and he sort of scoffed. And he said, little girl, you really don't believe that's true, do you? I mean, a grown man getting swallowed by a whale, staying in there for three days, then being regurgitated onto dry land. You don't really believe that, do you? And she goes, well, yeah, I do. And he just started berating her with these questions. Really? I mean, how, how did she not get chewed up while she was being swallowed? And how was there enough air in there for her to survive? And, and how, what about all the pressure when that fish went underwater? How did... And, and she, you know, when he finally finished asking questions, she didn't really know how to respond. She said, well, sir, I don't, I don't really know how to answer those questions, but one day when I get to heaven, I'll find Jonah and I'll ask him. <laughs> and he said, little girl, what if he's not there? And she said, well, well, then you ask him. <laughs> <laughs> We haven't really talked about this yet, um, but we need to talk about this big fish. You know, uh, this, you know, almost everyone's first connotation, when you say the book of Jonah, they're going to think about a fish, right? They're going to think about this whale. It's everyone's first connotation with this book. But for a lot of people, when they read the book of Jonah, it's a little bit hard to swallow. Uh, it's sort of like a whale of a tail. All right, I'm being facetious. Um, <laughs> no, lots of people just think, okay, this didn't really happen. This is a myth. This is a parable. In fact, even a lot of scholars who study the Bible for a living don't think this really happened. But I think this actually really happened in real life. And I'll, I'll tell you why. Really, three reasons. The first is, is that this is written as a historical book. We talked about last week. Jonah was a real person. He comes up in 2 Kings as well. He was a prophet under King Jeroboam II. He's a real man. The Ninevites were real people. They're the Assyrians. And if you read through this book, it reads like a very historical book. That's, that's reason number one. Second is, if this was a myth or a legend, those things kind of grow over time, right? They sort of stretch and they become more elaborate. If you've ever known a fisherman, the day they catch their fish, it's like this. A week later, their fish is like this, right? A month later, that's how legends go. They grow. But if you look in the book of Jonah, this part about the fish, it's like, it's like a throwaway. It's, it's not elaborate. It's, it's barely mentioned. It's mentioned three times, but only in passing. But the real reason I take this to be a historical account is because Jesus said it was. And I just have sort of a rule. If someone rises from the dead, I sort of take what they say as truth. <laughs> but listen to what Jesus said. I, I put it up here just so you could see it. Matthew 12. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, someone greater than Jonah is here. Jesus took this as truth, as something that happened in real life. Now, lots of people, in fact, lots of Christians try to get into the science of how this could have happened. I don't think that's really necessary. I think we say this is a miracle. This is a miracle like parting the Red Sea was a miracle, or, or walking on water, or rising some, raising someone from the dead. This is miraculous. You read the Bible, the assumption is, is God's the creator. He's the one who's not bound by all of the things that you and I are bound by. He can do the miraculous. And so we say this, this is miraculous. I mean, think about it this way. God created us, right? Man has figured out a way to keep a whole village of people alive underwater in, in submarines for months at a time. So if we can figure out how to keep a village of people alive underwater for months at a time, certainly God could figure out a way to keep one man alive underwater for three days. Right? So this is miraculous. Now, we're going to get into chapter 2, and I think you're going to be able to relate to Jonah exactly where he is. Um, we're, going to, we're going to read Jonah chapter 2. We'll first start with the story, but then I think that we're going to all see that there's a reality that we all face, and then there's an amazing truth about who God is. Okay, so we're going to see a reality, and then this truth about God. So if you have your Bibles, open with me to Jonah. Again, no shame in using the table of contents. 
Or an easy way is to find Matthew in the New Testament and go back backwards seven books. Um, but we are in chapter 2. Actually, we're going to start with the last verse of chapter 1, which if you had a Hebrew Bible, that would actually be the start of chapter 2, um, which makes more sense because then bookended in this chapter would be talking about this fish. So uh, 1 verse 17 it says, Now the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. From inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. And a lot of people think he prayed because he had nothing else to do. <laughs> um, it's interesting. When you look at the prayer that Jonah's about to pray, it's going to sound a lot like the book of Psalms. In fact, Jonah basically prays portions of eight different Psalms, which there's really a good lesson for us in that. Jonah was so familiar with the book of Psalms that when he's in this desperate situation and he prays to God, what comes out is scripture itself. When he didn't know what else to pray, it's the words that he had re rehearsed about who God was that he just ended up praying back to me. If you don't ever, if you feel like, man, I don't really know how to pray, just pray through the book of Psalms. Let those be the words that are sort of running in your head. That's what Jonah does. Let's keep going. Verse two. This is his prayer. In my distress, I called to the Lord, and he answered me. From deep in the realm of the dead, I called for help, and you listened to my cry. You hurled me into the depths, into the very heart of the seas, and the currents swirled about me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. I said, I have been banished from your sight. Yet I will look again toward your holy temple. The engulfing waters, they threatened me. The deep surrounded me. Seaweed was wrapped around my head. To the roots of the mountains, I sank down. To the earth, and earth barred me forever. But you, Lord my God, brought my life up from the pit. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. Those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. For them. But I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will make good. I will say, salvation comes from the Lord. And the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. Every middle school boy, boy loves that verse. <laughs> all right, so let's talk about a reality that all of us face. Uh, it's, it's what we see in this passage. Here's the reality that all of us, go underwater. Sooner or later, all of us. For Jonah, it was quite literal. Jonah had been running from God. He'd been trying to escape from him, trying to avoid doing what God wanted him to do. He was straining with all his energy, all his resources to try to get off on his own, away from God. But then he gets thrown into the sea, into a situation that's literally way over his head, and he can't make it anymore. He's come to the end of his rope. If you look at chapter 1, it's interesting. The whole trajectory of Jonah's life has been down. You know, God tells him to go to Nineveh, and Jonah, Jonah goes down to Joppa. Then he's on the ship, and he goes down into the belly of the ship. And then the sailors throw him into the water, and he sinks down into the water. Jonah's headed in this downward direction. And at this point, he can't get any lower. He's hit sort of rock bottom. All his energy is spent... And he's scared. He can't see beyond what he's facing in this moment. I mean, look at verse 3, 5, and 6 again. You, you hear how he's sort of at the bottom. You hurled me into the depths, into the very heart of the seas. And your currents swirled about me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. The engulfing waters threatened me. The deep surrounded me. Seaweed was wrapped around my head. To the roots of the mountains I sank down. And earth beneath barred me in forever. He's at the bottom. Have you ever been close to drowning? It's an incredibly scary feeling. The home I grew up in, my parents had a pool in the backyard. And um, as a teenage boy, we, had, we put like two basketball hoops on the sides of the shallow end. And oftentimes we'd have ten guys over there playing like full contact water basketball. And several times I ended up on the bottom of a pile of like eight guys, and uh, I would run out of air. 
except I was being held down. You know, I probably had the ball and wouldn't let go or something. Um, but in that moment, you go from having this great time to really panicking and, and thinking, this, this is it. And that's where Jonah is. He finally gets to the point where he's ready to take his big breath and he has this mouth full of seaweed. He's in a place where he can't survive. Now, this was all very physical for Jonah, but this happens for all of us. We hit the bottom. We all go underwater. Where we feel like there's no relief from what we're struggling with. You've all been there. If you haven't been there, just live a little bit longer. You'll get there. Maybe some of you, even this morning, I'm sure in a crowd this size, some of you are there right now. Um, I want to share something with you, uh, actually, that my wife wrote a couple years ago when we were quite underwater. Um, she called this the waiting room. Oh, God, not here. Not here again, please. I recognize this place. It's both the same and different. It's the place I am so familiar with, yet each time I feel like a bit of a stranger, an aimless wanderer with no real place to land. Oh, there are plenty of places to sit, but nowhere to land. Everything changes, yet everything's the exact same every time. I look at everything, but I see nothing. The walls, the seats, the screens, the decor, they're all so embedded so deeply in my memory that I don't even notice them anymore. Oh, I remember other walls, couches, noises, and smells from the same sort of places in a different location. I'm no longer a newcomer to this place. I've had lesson after lesson of how to pass the time, how to distract myself, what things to focus on, what tasks to try to get done, and yet... I've learned the painful truth that time moves slowly in this place. God, haven't I logged enough hours in these treacherous walls of torment? My husband is here. He's been with me every time, in every room, for every hour. I look at him and I wonder what he thinks about this place. Who am I kidding? I know what he thinks of it. He hates it as much as I do. We come to this place very differently. We learn. I try to process as much as I can ahead of time to prepare myself. He processes more in the moment. Sometimes there's family and friends with us. Sometimes we're here alone. The details are different, but the weight of the weight is much the same. I've had lots of time to observe the people who share this room with me. Sometimes we make eye contact, sometimes small talk, sometimes we try desperately to avoid the pain in each other's eyes. The longer you've been in and out of here, the more quickly you're able to spot the newbies. Their fear is so raw. I remember my own first few days here, and I ache for them. This place does not discriminate. People from every race, neighborhood, belief system are here. Many of their stories are more intense than my own, and many pale in comparison. Whether it's tonsils being taken out or hearts being operated on, each story is unique, and each person is being pushed to their own new limits. The details are different, but the weight of the weight is much the same. This waiting room of mine for the past 15 months has been very physical, very tangible. But I'm not alone in my waiting. I know so many who are waiting for so much. Waiting month after month to see a little blue line appear on a little plastic stick. Waiting to hear the word remission. <clears throat> waiting for a diagnosis that they hope will bring some answers. Some are waiting for some sort of financial stability. Some for freedom from addictions that have long enslaved them. Some are waiting for husbands to stop exchanging true beauty for cheap substitutes. Some are waiting for a lover's hand to hold. Some are lovers and they're holding hands waiting for death. Some are waiting for reconciliation. Some just waiting for resolution. 
Some are waiting to see the good that will come, and some just feel like they are waiting for the day when they can stop waiting. The details are different, but the weight of the weight is much the same. All of us go under water. And even in reading some of those examples, I hope it strikes a chord when you remember that time when you were under water. When, when you were in a place where you ran out of resources, where you ran out of energy, where you didn't think, how am I going to keep moving forward? When the future just looked sort of gray, you stopped being able to picture what was coming. That's where Jonah is. Now here's something really challenging about being in that spot. And it actually comes out in verse 3. Jonah says this, You hurled me into the depths, into the very heart of the sea, and the current swirled about me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. Now isn't that interesting? Who is it that hurled Jonah into the sea? If you were here last week, we read just a few verses before. It was the sailors who picked up Jonah and threw him into the sea. So why doesn't it say, the sailors hurled me into the seas. Jonah says, God, it was you who hurled me into the depths. Because Jonah knows that God is sovereign. God is in control. He ordains everything. So even the difficult things that you and I deal with, God is ultimately behind them. Ultimately, it's his will that's being carried out. And this is sometimes what makes it the hardest. I'm sure you've felt this before. God, why have you allowed this to come into my life? God, if you're all powerful, you could have stopped filling the blank. It's a hard reality that whenever you and I go underwater, we have to wrestle with the fact that God's ultimately in control and allowed that to happen. Whenever you and I are in that place, when that sort of truth sinks in, that God's sovereign, that he's somehow allowed that, we have two choices we can make. There's really only two paths forward. You can go down one path, and you can say, well, then forget you, God. If you're going to allow me to go down this road that's so uncomfortable, that's so painful, this place where I can't survive, then you must not be good. You must not be uh, who you say you are. Forget you. That's one path you can go down. The other path is to choose sort of the path Jonah's taking. Where in faith, where you, when you've got nowhere else to turn, you turn to God. And you say, I know you're in control of all this, and I'm going to cry out to you for mercy, because I need help. Why is it that God can be trusted in our pain? Why, why when, when life is really hard and we know that ultimately God's behind that, why should we run toward God and not away from him? That's a very important question. And I want you to hang on to that. We're going to come back to that at the end. It's a crucial question because whether or not you're in a painful spot right now, it's going to come. Which, which path are we going to take when the, when the next time we go underwater? So we'll come back to why, why we should trust God in those moments. So first we've seen in this passage that there's a reality. All of us are going to go underwater. But then there's this amazing truth that Jonah reminds us of. And that is that God is a God who answers our cries of distress. God is not far away. He's not indifferent to our pain. He's there. He's ready to respond. That's what Jonah experienced. If you just read his prayer, that's the theme. That's what he says over and over again. I'll just read portions. He says, in my distress, I called to the Lord and he answered me. I called for help. You listened to my cry. Lord, you brought my life up from the pit. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you. My prayer rose to you, to your temple. I will say salvation comes from the Lord. Jonah, he's dying. He calls out to God. He's scared. He thinks it's the end, and God 
delivers him. God shows up. Now, I want to make a few observations about God's answers, because we see some of them here, uh, and, and uh, they're really important when God answers our cries. So the first is this, that God answers our cries, often it feels like in the nick of time. When do you think Jonah started praying to God? I think it was when the sailors were going, one, two, oh wait, do we throw on three or do we wait till after three? Like he's in midair and I think he starts crying out to God. And he's crying out to God while he's fighting in the water. When he takes, takes his first breath of seaweed, I, I think he's crying out to God. But did you notice when God finally delivers him? Verse 7 said, when my life was ebbing away, which literally means when I was losing consciousness. God waited until the very last possible second before showing up for John. And that is often how God works. God wants us to get to the end of all of our own resources, to get to the end of ourselves, where we have nowhere else to turn but to turn wholly on him. Uh, Peter, Peter no, Paul, Paul says it this way, 2 Corinthians 1. He says, we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about the troubles we experienced in the province of Asia. Paul says, we went underwater. He says, we were under great pressure far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we've received the sentence of death. But this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God, who raises the dead. God delivers but in the nick of time. Abraham Lincoln said this, he said, I have been driven many times to my knees by the overwhelming conviction that I have nowhere else to go. That's when God loves to deliver us. It's when we get to the point where we've, we've got nothing else. And so we turn to him for help. So the challenge for each of us in that is to wait. To wait on God. To just keep waiting a little bit more. It might not be the nick of time yet. So whatever you're waiting for on God, to keep waiting. That's what we experience in the book of Psalms over and over. You'll hear them say, wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. Wait for his deliverance. The second thing I think we see about God's answering is that it comes in stages. It doesn't come all at once. I mean, notice where Jonah is when he's having this prayer of thanksgiving. He's praying for deliverance, but now he's sitting in the middle of, of the belly of a fish. That's not very comfortable. And yet Jonah realizes he has been delivered. He was dying. Now he's in the belly of a fish, which might not seem that much better, but he sees that that's God's deliverance. Sure, it's not his ultimate deliverance. That's still to come for Jonah, but he is thankful. I think that's our challenge there is we're praying to God for deliverance when we're underwater, and it might be in stages. And the challenge there is to be thankful to however God provides. It might look different. It might not be comfortable. But God provides in our distress. And then lastly, about God's answering, and this is probably the most important, is that it's holistic. God's the only one who has true perspective. And what God cares most about is our hearts and where they are. And there's a lot of miracles in the book of Jonah. I mean, you could point to God creating this huge storm, or when they cast lots, the lot fell on Jonah. Or, or when the storm was stilled, when Jonah was thrown overboard. Those are all miracles, but the biggest, or when he ordains a fish to swallow Jonah. But the biggest miracle in this book is when God somehow is able to soften this hard heart of Jonah. And so God's going to answer our prayers for distress, but he's going to do it in a holistic way so that God gets our hearts in the process, not just saves us out of whatever circumstances. And I, I don't know, I'm sure you've experienced this, because I have, but God, he really speaks to us in those painful times. Um, you've probably heard the quote from C.S. Lewis where he says, God whispers in our pleasures, he speaks in our conscience, but he shouts in our pain. It's his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. I uh, read this verse, I mean, I'm sure I've read it before, but it's the first time it's sort of sunk in in Job. Uh, look at this. It says, 
He delivers the afflicted by their affliction. He opens their ear by adversity. One of the ways God is delivering us from some of the deeper things is through the very thing he's taking us through. That is his true deliverance. So I think that brings us back to we have to trust him. That he has that perspective that we don't have. So that brings us back to that question that I said we'd come back to. Why should we trust God when he allows us to go through the painful? When he allows us to be in that season of waiting? When he allows us, uh, whether it's from our own sinful choices like it was for Jonah, or just the fact that we live in a broken world, why should we choose the path of trusting God rather than rejecting God? And I think the answer to that question is because we know God's motives. God has forever proven his motives for us back on the cross. When he allowed his own son to go underwater. When God sent his own Jonah-like person, who also fell asleep on, in the middle of a storm, um, who also willingly allowed himself to be thrown overboard, to be killed for the good of other people. Jesus, when he was dying on the cross, just like Jonah, cried out to his God when he was in distress. Except God, who's a God who answers his kids in distress, decided, no, I'm not going to answer him. Why did God turn his back on his son? He did it for each of us so that he wouldn't have to turn his back on us when we cry out to him. And then Jesus spent three days and three nights in the belly of the earth and emerged to life again. God's forever proven his love. You know, I think many people, and I think I've done this for years, we sort of judge God's love for us based on our circumstances. So when I'm going through something great, God loves me. He's happy with me. When I'm going through something hard, God doesn't love me. That's completely the wrong way to look at it. God's forever proven his love. So whether I'm going through something hard or something great, I know God's motives in that. So I can choose the path of trusting him. That, that needs to be a, a matter that's forever settled in your mind. Or every new experience you go through, you're going to wonder, is God for me or is he against me? He's forever proven it in the cross. Now, there's an incredible opportunity when we think about being at the bottom. And whether it's for ourselves or whether it's the people we encounter. Many of us, we're never going to open ourselves up to God unless we're at the bottom. And so as you encounter your friends, your neighbors, your coworkers, if they're at the bottom going through something really hard, there's probably a spiritual receptivity there that's not going to be there any other time. So you may have a sort of Jonah-type moment as we're praying this prayer with someone who's going through something really hard. Uh, I tell to point them to Christ. But what I want us to do as we sort of end is some of you, we're all in different spots. Some of you are probably right in a moment right now where you're underwater. And, and you need God. You're crying out for distress. So we're gonna, what we're going to do is we're going to put a psalm up on the screen. The band's going to play after, come up and play after I pray. And uh, we're just going to create some space to sort of read this psalm. The psalm's going to talk about waiting on the Lord. Um, but then many of you probably are connected to someone who's underwater. And this can be a real time to, to intercede for them on their behalf. To, to pray for them and what they're going through, that, they, that God would holistically deliver them from what they're doing. So let me pray for us, and the band will come up, and uh, we'll have a time of prayer reading the song.